because I'm uh, such okay. a nice guy. There we go. No, okay, we welcome great. everybody to the 2nd of November Hyperledger Supply Chain and Trade Finance Extravaganza here. After lots of work, we're going to spend time here today talking about uh, an ebook that many people as part of this SIG have been working on through uh, actually probably most of this year here. So uh, hold that thought. We're glad that you're here, whether you're uh, live or whether you're watching us on YouTube later on. First off, we'll do our normal uh, stuff here. Hyperledger, all are welcome. Looking for lots of thoughts, ideas. Um, bring them all out uh, to the rest of the, the rest of the group here. Also, please don't say anything confidential uh, here. But I believe in the ebook, we've gotten rid of any confidential stuff because this is a group that is an open source and open uh, community here. So with that, let me scroll down a little bit here. Uh, upcoming events. On the 16th of November, uh, tentatively, we're going to have Gian Lorenzo Meggio, PhD student, who's been working on a report for the European Commission on implementation of blockchain solutions. So he's going to spend a little bit of time with us on uh, November 16th. And tentatively, on November 30th, we have Dr. Mario Reichel um, from PPI, Payment Solutions Leader. And uh, he's going to talk about ISO 2020. 022. Uh, well, however you say that, um, in cross-border payments and harmonization, and most specifically, he's head of an implementation group uh, for non-finance. So right up our alley here on November 30th. And then December 4th, Hyperledger Member Summit in Tokyo, should you be in the neighborhood there. So with that, let's get rolling here. I've included a link here. And if you're... Uh, See the chat, you can go and um, bring up this link, and then you can actually see the ebook as we are, have, as it's currently constituent, put together. Uh, we'll use that word rather than constituted <laughs> here. Um, and our intent here is to walk through this ebook through the day. So let me switch pages and go here. Oops, let's bring this all the way back to the beginning and see where I was. Okay, so uh, here. How this came about way back when, probably February, something like that, uh, Daniela Barbosa had a Piper Ledger. She sent me an email and said, Hey, would you guys be interested in uh, creating an ebook? And so the next question was, What's an ebook? And we got into a little discussion. And, and the bottom line is trying to create a deliverable, a marketing piece, a high level white paper. Actually, white paper is probably the best description that describes a little bit of Hyperledger as well as describes a number of the use cases uh, that have been successful within supply chain and trade finance. And I think that's one reason why uh, this one came out in 2023 because we have some success stories associated with it. So um, the purpose is really, when we decided early on that the purpose is going to be more got geared towards a business audience and the solutions appropriate with that. We are not going to spend as much time on the technical solutions. Certainly over time, maybe that's a place that we go, but right now it's associated with business and what the values associated with that. Um, this is a document that we've been working on. We intend to have, have it live and make updates to it later on so that if you're watching this and you don't see your solution in here, you are more than welcome to contact us and possibly it can come into uh, future versions of this. So with that, let's go here and let's just look at the table of contents. And we have a number of people that will speak here and share some of their insights as they, they've done a lot of work as we've gone along here. Uh, first off, when we're an introduction, first off, a little bit of time here on what is Hyperledger. And then we'll talk a little bit about what's happening in blockchain and in supply chain and trade finance. And then we'll talk about our SIG specifically. And then the meat of this is all the use cases. Uh, there's been a lot of work going through trying to decide which use cases we provide uh, within, within this white paper, within this ebook here. And as you, as you look at these use cases, uh, the ones A through G here, they have a very definitive numeric benefit that we were able to uh, 
bring out and publicly say that uh, numeric benefit. And that was one of the major criteria for us, including uh, these use cases within our ebook here. And then following the use cases here, a little bit more about Hyperledger, and we'll talk, we'll talk about the future with this. So with that, Tomas, would you like to talk a little bit about Hyperledger here? You can you get to be Daniela today. Yeah, fantastic. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot, Tom. So I will just quickly cover our first uh, two pages of the ebook. Um, and thank you, Tom, uh, Alicia, Jeff, uh, Ned, for all the hard work on the book. Um, so let me just, for those of you not familiar with Hyperledger, let me just say that the Hyperledger Foundation is an open global source ecosystem for enterprise blockchain technologies. We're a part of the Linux Foundation, uh, and thus we are providing a neutral home for developers to collaborate, contribute, and maintain this open source software. The Hyperledger Foundation hosts a number of open source projects, and we'll come back to that uh, at the end of this book to a little bit more detail as much of the time we have, right? Because the ecosystem is really, really big. And all of our projects are developed and governed as an open source technologies, uh, which means that all the Hyperledger projects are actually community led. Now, one thing I would like to emphasize in regards to open source for those of you watching now or later that are not familiar with it, is that open source software um, is a trans uh, open source software development is a transparent process, uh, which is particularly well suited for blockchain technologies simply because of their uh, distributed nature. It brings together organizations and individuals uh, with different requirements and basically enable them to work together. Um, now, to some of the goals of the Hyperledger Foundation uh, is to provide a neutral, open, and community-driven infrastructure supported by technical and business governance. Um, it's also to foster the development and adoption of cross-industry platforms, which are powered by distributed ledger technology, and finally, to educate the public about the market opportunity for enterprise-grade blockchain technology. So. Um, you, there is a couple of links here in the book and you are welcome to uh, check out our website or also contact us directly if you'd like to learn more. And we will return to our ecosystem uh, at the end of the book after the use cases. But for now, uh, Jeff, uh, please over to you. Good. So, yeah. um... <laughs> oh, okay. By the way, I'll mention this you here. Can... We... Jeff is uh, Jeff Privich is one of the co-chairs for the special interest group, as well as Alicia, who will be following right after Jeff here. So thank you for your work throughout the year here together uh, to bring this together. So Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, just to recap on uh, what you're seeing on the page here. So you know why use blockchain for supply chain trade finance, and what what aspects and uh, characteristics of blockchain enable supply chains to be more effective and, and again i'm always when i say supply chain it's going to be supply chain and trade finance and so uh some of the very big issues around it is traceability um and immutability of the data that's in there and that becomes very important for transparency it becomes important for compliance because of the data is that's being put into the supply chain blockchain uh, is immutable um, also, use of smart contracts make that actions on, uh, on on data that comes in, especially around compliance, uh, more effective in dealing with issues quickly. So, blockchain is perfect for that traceability and immutability because often, if you get into situations as a vendor using relying on a supply chain, the ability to to have immutable data that su suggests maybe something went wrong with the product, something went wrong with the the uh, shipment of the product um, maybe it was broken, and so that Im that immutability of that data coming in, and again that results in traceability, allows more efficient uh, interaction between producers and retailers. So those characteristics around blockchain over other systems is very important. And again, we're going to be giving some examples in here about how blockchain is very efficient at. And you can see for the first paragraph, reducing disputes, that's a very big one, fraud and payment cycles. And so, um, and there's an example of, of how with um, shipments, more, it, can, it can be more efficient. So 
um, good overview here on this page of how blockchain has advantages over traditional IT systems. Good. Thanks, Jeff. Alicia, you want to go, go to the next page here? Sure, thank you. Okay. okay. So our next page is about us, about our SIG, the Supply Chain and Trade Finance SIG, which was really created last year, early last year, by merging two different SIGs, by merging the Supply Chain SIG and the Trade Finance SIG. So our membership is global. We have people with supply chain backgrounds, logistics backgrounds, trade finance backgrounds, all professionals who are looking to learn more and really move the state of supply chain industry forward by using enterprise grade block, uh, blockchain solutions, by developing them, by learning what other companies are doing, by learning what the capabilities are, sharing best practices, sharing what's been learned through their work. Um, we have, we, we regularly have meetings every other week that incorporate presentations by people from across the industry. We have people who attend live from around the world. And then we also have people who watch the recordings afterwards. We share them on YouTube. We post those links onto our wiki so that people can learn from not just our live events, but also our library, our, our ever growing library of um, past resources. In addition to that, in last year we've created a weekly news digest. This was something that Andrea Frosinini really drove that initiative. So every week now there is a, uh, there is a digest of current news, what's going on in supply chain, what's going on in trade finance, especially related to blockchain. And we also um, find other ways that our members can learn about different topics we're interested in. And uh, you'll see at the bottom of this page, we've got flyers from a couple of different presentations we've had. Picture of Eric Valiquet, one of our former chairs speaking live at an event in Toronto last year. And then over on the right, that's a hyperlink to the YouTube channel, part of Hyperledger's YouTube channel. This is the playlist specifically of webinars from RC. So if you're watching this right now and you're interested in learning more, all of these resources are great ways for you to learn more about specific Hyperledger uses and also learning more about the SIG and how you can take part. So please do click through on the visit our wiki, click through onto our LinkedIn page and follow and come join us for a meeting. We'd love to have you. And from that, yeah, we'd love to have you. <laughs> yeah. Tom, do you want to start talking about the use cases? So let's roll here and let's talk about this. So so how do we decide on these use cases? I mentioned a little bit earlier, certainly we're looking for supply chain and trade finance use cases. So that was kind of the first uh, category or the first gate to get through. Second is that these use cases, these implementations needed to use some flavor of Hyperledger, one of the Hyperledger projects within their solution. Uh, it turns out that many of them are fabric related, probably not too much of a surprise associated with that, but at least the, the criteria was you got to be using one of the Hyperledger projects. And Tomas will talk a little bit about the different projects a little bit later on. Uh, next, as I mentioned, is uh, production. The use case or the solution needs to be in some form of production. And then next is that there needs to be some sort of publicly available numeric benefit. And that could take many forms. I mean, yeah, it could be in the terms of currency. I'm saving these amount of dollars, this amount of yen, this amount of, uh, um, oh God, why am I drawing a blank here? <laughs> Anyways, it, whatever currency it is here, it, I mean, it could be in that flavor as a cost savings or revenue enhancement. That's always fairly challenging to do. So we took it to the next level and said, hey, if you can put some sort of numeric benefit, you made something happen happen more quickly, right? Or you were able to reduce costs and just say a number, you don't have to say the actual amount, you just have to say a percentage amount that goes along with that. Th those are sufficient to show that there is benefit associated with this beyond the fact of, oh, blockchain is good and we like to, we like to do those kind of things. And we'll talk a little bit because in the additional projects, there's a section of ones that uh, we'll talk about more specifically and there's additional projects. Additional projects generally 
they they were ones that did not have numeric benefit in some way, shape, or form in a public forum, right? Or they weren't totally in production yet, but there's something interesting. Or there's something that has is, is more of a standards focus there. So that's why we get into the additional projects, but still we wanted to share them with uh, the audience here, uh, looking at what's going on in supply chain and trade finance. So that's a little bit of an underpinnings associated with this and the criteria uh, for inclusion inclusion here. So let's go through and uh, we're gonna roll and have everyone kind of share who the people who have done most of the work in validating these use cases together with the organization. We're gonna let them share for a, a minute or two what they uh, like about this different use case. So with that, we're gonna start with eProvenance. And I think that's you, Jeff, right? That is me. So this is a good example of how um, blockchain can be used to trace uh, shipment and supply chain of uh, perishable items. And in this particular case, um, there's a company called eProvenance, Pro if I pronounce that right, and they have something called the Vinisher platform. So just for a minute, think about yourself purchasing a bottle of wine anywhere in the world opening it up no matter what the price is and it, it tastes bad it doesn't taste right it's not spoiled it just tastes bad that's that's the fear of all wine producers around around the world they get they get a wine through the retailer and it doesn't taste uh, as it should so what was the problem well first of all they don't really know today but secondly the financial arrangements in these situations are the the wine producer eats the cost so it's returned and i've done this myself but bring a purchase bottle of wine it's not there's different ways wine can get ruined but you can tell that this has been spoiled and so retailers automatically take them back and the way it works today is it gets sent back to the producer and they eat the cost and the producer is not in a position to say what actually happened to it they've tested it when it left the winery but uh, by the time it hit the store shelf and was opened up by the customer um there's been some kind of issue so what Blockchain allows them to do through the Vinishore platform is quite unique. And what they're doing with some major wineries right now, and again, their business has been growing, is the use of IoT. So inside bottle caps or on cases of wine, again, it depends on, excuse me, <clears throat> what the um, particular winery is doing. They'll have temperature and pressure settings that actually go into the bottle cap. And I've actually seen one of these and they're reusable. And they track from that winery um who has sampled it by the way and, and done some extensive chemical analysis to say what the what the flavoring was they will track that through the supply chain so iot devices will send out the temperature and pressure and again pressure is mostly associated you say why is there pressure in wine champagnes and expensive wines um, can be put under conditions where some of the pressure escapes and the, the corks let go so they have both readings but as this data comes in the blockchain Again, it's immutable, so now it can't be changed. It allows them to trace the tra tracking of that wine, the conditions from the time left that winery, whether it's going across an ocean or across the country, what kind of conditions, environmental conditions, conditions have they been exposed to? And they do have bounds around those that the just logistic companies have to follow for wine. So, for example, if it makes it all the way through, let's say in the U.S. from the, from California, ends up in the Midwest if it's September, which a lot of them. Uh, wine producers, that's when they send their wine out. Um, if it's been exposed to 95 degree heat for two days, that wine potentially get, get spoiled. And so these IoT devices continuously read off of conditions and send it over to the blockchain. Inside the blockchain, again, another advantage of blockchain over applications are smart contracts. So smart contracts pick up this data and it can tell within the smart contract what's happening with that wine. And before it hits that shelf in retail, alarms go off and say, this wine has been spoiled not for sale to the customer so it prevents that winery from giving bad wine to the customer also it tracks the finances so they know through the conditions of that bottle of wine or that case of wine crossing the country or the ocean where that was exposed to environmental conditions that uh, degraded that wine and so from a financial standpoint you got two things taking place one is uh, logistics suppliers know that the bottles are now being tracked, so they tend to be more vigilant over the conditions exposing that wine. And also, if a supplier, uh, well, this logistics um, company that's handled it from the supplier down the chain uh, has spoiled this now in their purview, and that's where the smart contracts can penalize that 
chipper for saying you're the individual to spell that line. So just to recap on this, and it's been very successful. So a couple of very big wineries. Um, there's a couple of French wineries that have, have now been put on the platform since this writing. But again, tens of thousands of bottles uh, they've noticed already have not from one big um, Napa, Napa uh, producer to save them tens of thousands of bottles not being returned because a lot of that is associated with or most of it is uh, transportation companies, logistics companies being very vigilant on the penalties associated with these wines if they're exposed for certain time periods to conditions that harm that wine. So again, blockchain has a large advantage of the ability to handle smart contracts, mutable data coming in from IoT devices so they know that there's no central authority that could be changing that data and also um, traceability. So um, very good application of blockchain technology across uh, items that are perishable. And I know there's some olive oil companies that are looking at the same type of solution. Beautiful. Thanks, Jeff. Let's roll to the next one here. GSBN. I think, Tomas, you're going to share a little bit about this one. Sure. I'll uh, quickly go through it. I know we have still a lot on our plate, uh, so I'll try to sum it up. And just to let you know that if you're interested in more uh, details on this use case, we have both case study written on it as well as the webinar and both are linked down here. So please follow these links uh, to get more info. So Global Shipping Business Network, in short, is a trade data utility platform and it's built on Hyperledger fabric. Indeed, as uh, all of the project in this ebook. Now, very briefly, what is the problem? So why did this come about? So first of all, global uh, container shipping is very inefficient and it's burdened by paper-based processes. And some of the pertinent issues that are, um, you know, the GSBN is trying to solve is that the data uh, among these multiple stakeholders is really trapped in the organizational silo. Uh, there's a lot of manual and time-consuming processes, uh, paper-based, you know, EDI, uh, fax machine, believe it or not, um, and clearance, uh, custom clearances take too long and are uh, often subject to fraud. And um, in fact, one report, I think, from Harvard Business Review estimates that um, that um, a, a sort of customs fraud uh, amounts to about half a billion dollars each year. Um, so, and this brings us to high costs and poor customer service. And there's actually a research done by um, uh, by Thomas Jensen mm -hmm. from Copenhagen Business School, who was following the shipment of roses from uh, Kenya to Netherlands. And he found that the, um, the shipping of the paper documentation following the container um, is actually caused the same amount as actually shipping that container, which is just mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And um, a report by the United Nations uh, Social Commission for Asia Pacific uh, estimates that a region-wide cross-border paperless trade would generate uh, almost $260 billion in additional trade annually. And this is basically what GSBN has been trying to do, to optimize the flow of information across global supply chains, uh, simplify global trade, and accelerate the digital transformation. So basically, we are talking about the large infrastructure for exchanging uh, this information based on blockchain. Uh, now, just a quick word of why we are using the blockchain in this sort of um, applications. So... You know, if it's so outdated, right, and we have all of this track and trace, we have Amazon or UPS, you know, you can always trace your package. Well, the big problem in global container shipping is that um, not only the data is fragmented, but um, these companies are often in competition with each other. So you really need blockchain here to get this distributed trust, right? So um, if you want to have the digitized global supply chain, where will the data reside, right? And having this distributed ledger to basically uh, uh, um, facilitate this trust is uh, something that is uh, needed in this uh, type of scenario. And uh, just to finish up, uh, Global Shipping Business Network uh, right now handles one third of the global container shipments. Okay, that's it about GSBN. And uh, please follow our case study and the webinar for more information. Beautiful. Thanks, Tomas. Okay. Alicia, you're up. Thank you. Next one on here. 
audience members will remember that back in February, we heard from Pequon Luck at DLT Labs. Well, a few months ago, a few weeks ago, DLT Labs was rebranded as Connects. And Connects has their asset track platform with a freight tool that is being used by Walmart Canada, among other companies, that's had a huge impact in creating a lot of benefits. Uh, for their use, Walmart's experience, Walmart observed that the freight process went from being 11 different steps of the freight payment process, went from 11 different steps to only five steps. People involved in payments, people on the accounts receivable side know that days sales outstanding. This can have a huge impact on cash flow and on companies being able to um, to pay their bills. Well, what had been more than, say, more than 30 days, that is now down to less than 48 hours. That That's a huge impact on cash flow management makes things a lot easier and a lot less stress. Shipment disputes. Think about when a company is saying, you know, this this didn't arrive and the logistics provider is saying we were there or our drivers had to wait several hours before they were unable to unload, before they were able to unload. Well, now because of the tracking with the asset track freight, these shipment disputes have gone from 70% to less than 2% annually. Um, They've also seen they've seen a close to five percent um, ROI of their annual freight spend. That's when you think about a company the size of Walmart Canada, that really adds up. So any company that has logistics where logistics is an issue, this demonstrates that the Connects platform provides a lot of value. If you're looking in the ebook at the bottom of the profile, we see the Hyperledger member case study. We also see several webinars, both the ones from RSIG back in February. And then a few years ago, Shannon Hamilton of Connects presented to the supply chain SIG. And more recently, uh, Loudon Owen was part of a team that wrote a Harvard Business Review article on how Walmart Canada uses blockchain to solve their supply chain challenges. I encourage everyone to go look at those resources and learn more. Okay. Beautiful. All set there, Alicia? Yeah. Go on. Yeah. Thank you. Trade Waltz up Okay. Next. I'll talk about uh, Trade Waltz here. And Trade Waltz has some similarities to uh, GSBN. It's uh, East Asia focused. It started back in 2017, so pretty early on here. And uh, they had originally um, 13 members. Now it's grown to 40 primary members and 140 overall members that are using Trade Waltz. Interestingly enough, they started going in uh, right before COVID. So um, one of the issues is I got all this paperwork, as Tomas was talking about earlier, with letters of credit and invoices and bills of lading, I got all this paper, but if you're not in the office due to COVID, then it's kind of hard to access all that paper here. But having a trade platform a la Trade Waltz here, uh, you're able to access all that stuff from anywhere and work together with the, all the, your trading partners. Uh, and the good news here, if you look on the right uh, green box there, the um, top item here, increased operational efficiency by 47% in actual usage. So that's the kind of numeric benefit that we're talking about in each one of these or bring, bring, wanted to bring out very strongly here. So, you know, when you talk about 72 hours to process paperwork in, in uh, Japan or 235 hours to process it, some places in Egypt or over 400 sometimes in Africa and $350 per transaction, reduction of 47% is, is very material here. Uh, and one other fun fact here that, uh, Back in 2021, Trade Waltz actually uh, did some work where they moved bill of lading from their system over to another company's Ethereum-based system. So it, the good news here is that none of this is closed. This is open, just like the idea behind all of the Hyperledger communities here and able to share with other blockchains out there. So with that, let's move on to the next one, trust your supplier. And Alicia, I think we're back to you. Yeah, back to me. So trust your supplier is a platform that was developed by US company Chainyard and IBM. 
for um, so the supplier management platform. They work together um, using industry standards and by working with global companies to build an entire team um, for their platform that does end-to-end -end supplier life cycle and risk management. Uh, and within that, they're embedding information from third-party verifiers and from companies' rating systems. So think about Moody's Analytics, think about Dun & Bradstreet. That information can be included in, bo in both supplier and buyer profiles, making it a lot easier to onboard. Um, looking, Thinking about the results, again, over to the little results box on the right-hand side of the page for one customer. Their business case showed that their supplier onboarding time went from 25.4 hours to four and a half hours. So this was reducing by 82%, which saved them a million and a half dollars. Their supplier screening time, aggregated, aggregated screening time for one customer was reduced by more than a hundred hours. That saved two and a half million dollars. So, um, also quality assessments, the time on that went down by 26%. And performance audits for one customer were reduced by 50%. That's an additional two and a half million dollars. These numbers add up. These are the types of benefits that customers experience when using this platform. If you look at the bottom of the page, you'll see that there is a Hyperledger member case study. You'll also see a member webinar um, a Hyperledger member webinar on Trust Your Supplier, and then a webinar where Gary Store from Chainyard came and presented their platform to our SIG, and then a recent Harvard Business Review article where they were featured, a remedy for supplier onboarding problems. So again, strongly recommend that people interested in learning more click through on those resources and learn more about this company and the work that they're doing. Okay, Beautiful. thank you. Thanks so Next up, Vertrax. Okay. We got two more here. Vertrax, Jeff, you're up. Got to come off the mute. It hasn't changed the screen yet. It's still on, oh, it's still on chain yard. I have there we problem. go. The user, user error. There we go. Okay. Uh, so um, next use case is, uh, again, it's, it, it's similar to the Venisure in a sense that the, the key here is the mutability of data coming in from IoT devices um, on a blockchain solution. And so uh, this company called Vertrax supplies, uh, supplies supply chain management software to logistics companies and, and their focus is oil and gas bulk shipments. And what these are, when you talk about oil and gas bulk shipments, these are short haul deliveries or what they often call transports where you've got several loading stations terminals around a metropolitan area and you've got fleets of trucks and how do you optimize when things should be picked up and when should they be um, delivered and to whom and so on and so forth and so I am not a logistics expert by any stretch but anybody out there who is knows how important linear models are and how difficult it is to keep those linear models um, accurate through assurance processes and so those are an art and a science the companies keep that technology un under wraps what and so what vertrex does that helps enhance those linear models by optimizing in real time where those trucks should be where they should be picked up uh, what parts should be picked up and delivered to who and it's just it's a mechanism that occurs 24 hours a day uh, vertrex and it's is a blockchain again a private blockchain uh, fabric it pulls a lot of that data in in real time through smart contracts, it gives updates to logistics people who can reroute trucks uh, for the most efficient mileage or the least amount of mileage to deliver oil and gas. You go to your local gas station, sometimes you'll see a gas station's truck there with its name on it. Often you see it not, and it's just a third party. And that's due to some of this, these changes that occur in real time. Blockchain is excellent at pulling that data from IoT devices, telling a truck, don't go here now, go over here. It's less miles to now effectively pick up the um, product and move it to where it's going to be delivered. So short haul companies, whether they're oil and gas deliveries or they're delivering materials for construction, they like to keep those trucks full and moving. An empty truck going on the road is not generating revenue. And so linear models uh, attempt to optimize pick up and delivery, pick up and delivery as much as possible. Vertrax sits out on top of that. 
through IoT devices and also again through its ability to smart contracts to ship data to its linear models in more real time. Plus, but you, you get an oil and gas delivery company, a bulk, so, sorry, oil and gas bulk delivery company um, delivering the same amount of gallons in a lot less miles. And you can see the, if you can see down there, but cost savings range from five to dollars per mile. And that's, that's conceived somebody close to over $700,000 a year and, and um, reduced costs and through the ability to deliver same volume through less miles. And essentially what you also can do, you can now have your fleet more effective, you can deliver even more. So that's the advantage of blockchain with the use of IoT devices. Good deal. Thanks, Jeff. Let's go on to the last one here before we get to the additional projects. Ventura, Ned. Yes. Uh, so to use the, the movie, Dude, Where's My Car? Well, this is kind of how these guys uh, the operate. So you think about the efficiencies associated with the assembly line about how everything is there but this company was focused on what happens when these finished vehicles leave and then tracking that so you think about how many vehicles are are built and then the fact that there's not a good tracking system to get them from the factory to the end consumer so the, you know they, they looked at this as you know, here was an area of logistics that was full of paperwork, inefficiencies, um, you know, when is a vehicle going to arrive, but also more data that we can put about a vehicle. And I realized that some of it has to do with like recall work. So they wanted to use the private blockchain as a way to store information about vehicles and then also be able to track them logistically from the factory to the end consumer. So this is something that a lot of, um, you know, they're doing a, a deal with Mitsubishi Europe, but not only finished vehicles, but you think of all the, uh, the, the companies that use vehicles just to track them, um, Avis, Hertz, uh, Fleets. So a lot of it is just a way to kind of just keep a lot of information about these vehicles after they leave the factory, um, tracking them, being able to cut down on costs associated with transportation. So right now they're looking at you know just the savings of around three to ten dollars per finished vehicle. So you think about how that will add in you know really some savings there. Um, it really is about taking a process that's very paper labor intensive, siloed, getting information in about these cars where people can access them. You know you have companies that are dependent on cars showing up. I mean come on, how many of us have always heard about a car? Hey, when's that car going to get here? Yeah, well, it's here. It's there. Yeah, it's it's in Detroit. It's it's in Hong Kong right now. When is it going to show up? This gives more of an insight to the vehicles that have left the factory, where they are, and it really can cut down costs for those on the receiving end, but also those that are shipping it. So this is something that not only for finished vehicles, but also for fleets, rental fleets, just company fleets, information that can be stored about these vehicles. Uh, it's it really has an opportunity to go beyond actually what their initial mission is. Beautiful. Thanks, Ned, for uh, sharing Ventura's uh, story here and pulling that one together here. So now let's go on to additional projects. So when I look back over the last six months or so, seven months, let's call it seven months here, I believe we went through probably 60, 70 different types of solutions, use cases out there. So the seven that you saw were the ones that met, met the overall criteria. Now, there are also ones that we thought were pretty cool also and wanted to include and share within this ebook, but they didn't meet the major criteria. And you see that up at the top on this, if they didn't have publicly available numeric benefit, they're not in production, but they might provide some unique value. Uh, they're not maybe uh, not broad based, they're very specific, or sometimes they're standards. And standards is we know blockchain is a team sport. Having some sort of standard is usually fairly important to being successful with a blockchain set of projects. So, with that, there's, I don't know, seven or eight uh, also additional projects here over the next three pages that you'll be able to look in. There's a, a link at the uh, with each one of them so you can get a little bit more information. Uh, a lot of them are coming from around the world. We're, we we, we try to have some diversity, not just US, not just Europe, not just Asia, ones that are all around. And you can see here the first one here, UA, 
Trade Connect, where they had a challenge where letters of credit were being shopped around and sometimes somebody might get uh, two sets of credit and they probably should only be getting one set of credit. So UAE folks built this solution uh, in order to prevent fraud when you're actually out there shopping these letters of credit there. Uh, be connected in the Mercosur, similar type of situation to GSBN as well as uh, trade walls and cross trade, uh, paperless trade uh, system for down in South America here. Botanical water technologies, they're hoping that they're going to be uh, getting clean water to 100 million consumers by 2025. So they're they're getting going here and hopefully maybe the next version of this, they'll move that up into 2024 and using and being able to track and trace the water that is coming from agricultural uh, processing there. Uh, Moby, do you want to talk about this, Alicia, or anybody like to talk about Moby? Moby is a, um, a group that started a few years ago, global nonprofit alliance of company of vehicle manufacturers, and they have a platform. They've done several different projects around battery traceability. They're working with both public and private sector organizations. And um, if you look at the, if you watch the SIG webinar, you'll be able to get more in depth on that, on their work. Thank you. Thank you. And this is an example of a standard. Moby, they build stuff, but really they're trying to drive standards in uh, the mobility space, hence Moby. Okay, uh, longevity here. Um, again, a shippers and carriers, a track and trace type of solution here, uh, there. And maybe Jeff, if you wanna talk about go gas, and then most specifically uh, circular here with for one, a mining board and a store dot. Let me talk about go, go gas here. Um... GoGas well, yeah, so essentially is a pipeline management system implemented in blockchain. And so pipeline management systems, which I have some history of, of working with, is where you nominate or you schedule um, products to go through a pipeline. And then, of course, you also schedule the, as, as a consumer to pull it out of the pipeline. These are heavily regulated pipelines around the world. So GoGas has enabled us in blockchain. Why blockchain? Well, GoGas also has to be tied into some, um, well, let me, let me back a little bit. GoGas is not gasoline. GoGas is methane. It's natural gas. It's, it's gases used, propane and so forth that consumers use. So it's based on, on gases in that sense. But you also have renewable gases coming from the renewable energy industry, recycled uh, materials and so forth. And so when those are delivered, when you have a, a um, a block, a block of gas or so many square feet of gas put in, there's a renewable certificate that goes with that. And what blockchain is excellent at doing is, as transactions come in and blocks are made on the blockchain, there are private and public keys that go along with that. And those certificates can be digitized and locked down by the owner having the, having the private key. And those are then transferred to the, transferred to the other owners in the custody transfer process. So I hope I explained that correctly, but Blockchain is very good at digitizing certificates for carbon credits, natural gas credits from renewables. Um, as you'll see down below on circular, there's uh, materials that are mined and the certificates go with them. And these are all proof of, proof of authenticity for different lots of products form. Blockchain by far uh, handles that much better, or maybe the regular applications can handle the ability digitize and, and cryptographically sign certificates so you know those are authentic they get transferred to whoever the new custody owner is going to be in the material um go gas does that perfectly again it's, it's a trading platform in blockchain which it has which is rather interesting itself but also its ability to handle different types of gas where they came from whether they're renewable or not and, and handle handle those certificates so you know there's some genuine tracking of where these products came from the last one, Circular, both of those, Circular is a company that that uh, provides blockchain solutions, and those blockchain solutions are on hyperledger with that, but they're, they're very good at implementing those. And so the two at the bottom are what we call ESG, environmental, I forgot, I got a block, 
Learn on social, social and governance. Governance. The other one's governance. Yes, we need to get governance. And so, um, again, we're, we're, this is we're, we're Wanda, we're Tantalum, which is an all our phones, which is in these computers that we're looking at right now, is, is, mined, uh, is mined. And to prevent minors from using child or slave labor, we have OECD standards. I can't remember that stands for either, but go ahead and look up OECD. Um, there's certificates, electronic certificates that are cryptographically signed that go along with all the bags of tantalum that are produced, all the lots that are produced, so that when you purchase those, you can tell your customers who you're giving this to if you're a refinery and so forth that this has been sourced ethically and that proof is through those certificates. Same with store docs, uh, a store doc with um, CO2 tracking the, the provenances of CO2 emissions. Those come down to credits. And so those credits. Are they stored in a regular application? Let's say SAP. It's not effective at doing that. It really can't do that well. Blockchain comes in in blocks as a traceability through photography to, to show where that certificate came from, that it's authentic, and that you can use it and you can sell it and trade it just like currency based upon this blockchain's ability to track it. And so this, these are good examples. Again, when it comes to ESG, very hard to get numerics out of those firms because essentially when they're cleaning things up they won't admit the way things were in the past whether it's a company or government so uh ES, esg is going to be critical for, for a company to be able to do business because some of their customers are demanding the ability to prove where they're where they source their products yeah, jeff is understatement there with very hard to get numbers out of this we had many conversations <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how do we create some numeric benefit associated with what's happening there with uh, circular from undermining yeah, the store? Down. Very hard to go to a country and, and that comes in and says we're no longer using uh, China Square Labor. We can track it through our new, yeah. new, uh, yeah. a new software, blockchain, but you can't ask them, well, how many slave labor were you using in the past? So there you a, go. That's, that's a tough one. Okay. And we know even not to ask it, but. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. So, so that's the additional projects. You can look at all of these. Again, most of them have some links with some additional information uh, here to learn more about these. And I think most of the logos, if not all of the logos, have hyperlinks on them so that you can go directly to either the solution or the company that created those. So with that, let's see here. Oops. What's happening here? Why can't? There I go. We have, I'm going to do a time check here. We have seven minutes remaining before we turn into a pumpkin here. So, Tomasz, I'm going to let you talk a little bit more about the Hyperledger Foundation, and then we'll do a little wrap up here. Okay, cool. So, you I tell guess... me the chart you want me to go to. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks, Tom. So, I guess I have about five minutes. So, let me try to be concise here. Uh, if you can just go for a next one, uh, please, Tom. Uh, thank you. So as I mentioned earlier, we at the Hyperledger Foundation, we host a number of open source projects. And what we refer to as a project within Hyperledger Foundation is really a collaborative effort to deliver a work item. And each project has its own name, developer community and goals. As you can see here on the page where Tom is sharing, we have a number of projects listed uh, and they can be broadly categorized as a distributed ledgers, tools and libraries. And since we don't have time to go to each one of them um, individually, I would like to invite you to visit our website and see how to get involved, how to get um, the code and learn more. And all of these projects are also linked here in the ebook, so you can just uh, follow these links here. One thing I would also like to highlight from this page are Hyperledger Labs. Um, and these are, the you know, they provide a space where people can innovate and test ideas. Uh, without the creation of an official project. So please follow the link here to find out more. Um, Tom, can you go to next page, please? So Hyperledger Fabric is one of our projects and it's the most widely deployed enterprise blockchain platform uh, according to the report from Block Data, which is also linked here and you're welcome to check it out. Uh, it offers a modular flexible architecture with plug and play support for um, components such as consensus and also membership services. Um, and as you can see, um, you know, in this ebook, all of these uh, use cases were actually built using Hyperledger Fabric. And here is also the short introductory video, which you can uh, also see to get more information on it. Uh, next page, please, Tom. 
a little bit about the community work with Hyperledger. Uh, so we have a vibrant community uh, which is global and is advocating developing and deploying blockchain technologies. Apart from the supply chain and trade finance special interest group, which uh, prepared this book, uh, you can, we also have a number of other special interest groups, such as healthcare, um, telecommunications, climate action, uh, the financial markets, and so on. And you can find them following the link uh, here as well. We offer a lot of training and certification for both beginners as well as advanced users. Uh, and we're also organizing a lot of events, both in person and online, and here linked you can find our event page as well. If you're interested in finding more about the use cases of the technology, please also visit our use case tracker. And to get a bit more in-depth information, uh, please look at the case study library uh, and all are linked here. And as you saw in a lot of these use cases, there was, uh, there was already some sort of case study linked. And last but not least, uh, I would also like to invite you uh, to join a Hyperledger Foundation as a member. Our members are industry leading organizations, both large and small, uh, and are working on this project. If you would like to learn more about corporate membership, also please follow the link uh, over here. Now I have one minute left. Uh, Tom, if you can go two slides down, one more, please. Um, uh, just quickly mention the Hyperledger Global Forum, uh, and that is our largest annual gathering of the uh, Hyperledger community, or in other words, it's the biggest enterprise blockchain event of the year. The people who attend can hear directly from those who are actively developing these solutions using Hyperledger technologies. And uh, here you can also find some of the uh, sessions uh, uh, related to supply chain uh, linked uh, from the Hyperledger Global Forum 2022. Um, and also there is a link so you can see also other recorded sessions, you know, such as central bank digital currencies uh, or, or trade finance or healthcare and so on. And uh, please stay tuned uh, for our Hyperledger uh, Global Forum 2024 on the event site, uh, which will be announced on our event site, also linked here at the bottom. Okay, and I think I'm one minute over, Tom, but I guess it's still okay. Uh, that's quite all right. And I'll put a plug in for the Global Forum. I attended in March of 2020 in Phoenix. And that's actually where I learned about the uh, SIGs and uh, supply chain trade finance. So it was... With, in addition to all the other good reasons, that was a good reason to go to uh, to Phoenix for the Hyperledger Global Forum way back when in 2020. So with that, uh, let's do a wrap up here. Uh, certainly, there's been lots of people involved with this. The people on this page are the main people that have been involved with this ebook over the course of many months and a lot of research and a lot of work. And so definitely thank you for all the people that are on this uh, this page here as well as thank you to the folks who brought their solution forward. I mean, we're hoping that we're going to be able to include your solution in some way, shape, or form as your solution progresses out there in the marketplace. So with that, thank you very much uh, for joining us today or listening to the recording here. There's a couple links if you'd like to join uh, the Hyperledger Foundation as a member. Uh, there's the top link there that Omash talked about. And if you'd like to talk, to join our specific special interest group, there's a link as associated with that. We're planning on updating this at some more regular basis. We haven't decided what, probably more like a six to nine month type of um, cycle here where we would provide additional updates to this and keep it fresh, keep it alive, keep it uh, um, viable um, out there in the marketplace so you can use them as ideas for whatever solution you may have within supply chain and trade finance. So with that, thanks everybody for uh, joining today. And uh, thanks also for listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube as the case may be. And we look forward to uh, seeing you sometime in the future on one of our future sessions or as part of Hyperledger in a broader way. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. You're going to, you'll get the recording going, right? Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. Sure.